Several of you remember that a number of years ago, Lynn and Whitney and I had the opportunity to go to, go to Hawaii. And for me, it was going back to Hawaii because my, my family had lived there when Dad was in the military. I actually lived there for seven years altogether. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do when we got back there was to go visit the church that my family had been a part of. Now, I was just a, a young kid when uh, we first started there, so I didn't realize what was going on. But the Lord was working in my parents' lives, and they were, they were trying to walk with him. So we got involved in this church. It was actually called Makakilo Baptist Church. And uh, it was neat. We got to go visit it. Uh, Lynn and Whitney and I, we got to go visit it while we were there, and it was neat seeing them. And we actually, there was uh, one lady there who I remember their family, and she was friends with my parents. So it was kind of neat uh, catching up and so forth. But I, I, I always thought of that church. There was something about that church. In fact, what really made that church stand out for me was when we came back from Hawaii and we got to Alabama, where we were going to be living for a number of years, uh, we started attending other churches. We looked around for a while. I should say my parents looked around. I went wherever they told me to go. But uh, we looked around and we found a number of different churches and we finally, finally found one that we called home and we stayed there and, and, and it was good. I, I enjoyed being there at the church. It was, I mean, they were preaching the word of God and so forth. But something was different. And I always looked back at the church in Hawaii. There was something about that church that made it special for us. And, and I remember as a kid trying to figure all that out. Why is it that none of the rest of these seem to be doing that? Well, our church in Hawaii, first of all, there were a lot of military personnel there. And, and our church was made up of a lot of military people. Uh, there, there were Hawaiians and other people that lived there that weren't in the military. But that church was made up of primarily, I mean, a, a good part, military people. We, we weren't a huge church. I want to say maybe 50 to 75, our size, maybe just a little bit bigger than us. But it was close. And, and I think partly because it was military. And when you're in the military in Hawaii, you're over there and all your family's back on the mainland. So you're by yourself. You need something like a church to be a part of. And it became a family. And uh, we, as a family, they shared everything with each other. As a family, they took care of each other. As a family, they really met needs. And, and I, I come to realize that that's, that's what made that church so special. Is, uh, first of all, they were preaching the word of God. Uh, our pastor, is, we were in Hawaii, but it was a, he was a Chinese pastor from Texas. And that's, that's just the way that that all works out. But uh, his name was Raymond Lau. I remember he preached the gospel. He was a good man. But be, they went beyond uh, preaching the gospel. They preached the gospel. They also uh, helped us to live for the Lord and walk with the Lord. But then there was that family atmosphere with caring and taking care of one another. It, was, it really was beautiful. And, and that made that church special. Well, I started thinking through the other churches that, that I was a part of and how they were special. Well, I actually didn't get saved until I was 16 years old. I was, we were living in New York at the time, and I was uh, going to high school. And I, I ended up turning to the Lord for salvation. And I, I left. We were, our family went to a church that was not gospel preaching. Uh, for some reason, they, they kind of preached the gospel, but they kind of didn't. And when I got saved, uh, the Lord was, was helping me to kind of see through some things. And I got my parents' permission to go to another church. And the church I went to was called Alfred Allman Bible Church. And they were gospel preaching. But more than that, they were friendly. They were caring. They, they were loving. And, and we had a community. And, and I enjoyed that. And as I grew in the Lord the first couple of years, that's where I was. And the Lord used them to help me. Then I went away to college. And I uh, started attending a church when I was at Bible College called West Endicott Baptist Church. And that church became, for me, a, a big family. And, and, and again, they were preaching the gospel. They were teaching the scriptures. The goal was to help people walk with the Lord. And yet we cared for each other. We, and we, we were really a, a blessing to each other. And so I loved being a part of that church. In fact, when Lynn and I are on vacation this week, we're going to be spending a couple nights with our former pastor, Pastor Richard, uh, there in New York. And his, uh, his adult daughter still lives with him. His wife has passed away. But we're going to be spending a few days with him. And we're really looking forward uh, to that. But it was, it was a family. And then, um, um, at really, the next church that I became a part of was this church. Because when Lynn and I were part of, we're with a, we were with a mission agency and we were raising support uh, to get involved in church planting, which the Lord in his, 
in his sovereignty didn't allow us to do, but I believe he used it to help us grow. We were part of that church. That church was our sending church. And then when we withdrew from the mission, this church opened up. And, and through a different set of circumstances, we found out about it. And uh, we started filling pulpit here for a while until they could, until they found out they, they needed a full-time pastor. And then they called us. And uh, it, it, it's been wonderful. But we've, we've, I think we've got the same thing here. I think we've got a family atmosphere. I think, of course, we, we try to preach the scriptures, we try to teach and help each one of us to grow and walk in the Lord, but we also try to care for each other. And we try to uh, be a part of that circle, and, and, and I think that's an important thing. Well, I say all that to bring up the question, what are we supposed to be as a church? I know I just mentioned a lot of good things out there, but there's, you, you can be in a church that has a great family atmosphere and everybody loves each other but doesn't preach the scriptures. You know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you can be in a church that does a lot of wonderful <coughs> projects and so forth, but maybe they don't preach the scriptures. Or you can be like, I was in a church uh, when Lynn and I went to college in Florida. We attended a church there that was a, a good gospel preaching church, but that's all it ever did. It just preached the gospel every week. And I can remember looking around, and I knew pretty much everyone in the church. And I remember thinking, all these people have made professions of faith. I believe they are all saved. But that's all we got was the gospel preached every single week. Well, I don't think that that's right either, because there's more to the gospel. If you think about the Great Commission, when Jesus gave the Great Commissions to his uh, disciples, go ye therefore into all the world, and the first thing he talks about is evangelism, but then he goes on and he talks about training to walk with the Lord, training to obey Jesus and so forth, and that all needs to happen too. So, so with all that said, is where would we match up as a church? Uh, how would we look if someone put us under the microscope to see uh, where we stand on all that. Now, there's things that we don't have that some churches will find right away. You'll notice we don't have a worship team. I'm not against worship teams, by the way. Um, I don't necessarily favor them, but, but I'm not a, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Uh, we just don't. It's just not part of what we do. Um, I think it was Hesitations 4 9 that says you've got to have a worship team, right? <laughs> Hesitations is not a book in the Bible. I was joking. <laughs> um, I, and, and there's other things we may not have. We might not do this. We might not do that. There, there's, we, we might have certain tendencies that we do do that other people might not like. So that all that, where, where do we fit in there? What exactly are we trying to do? Well, I want to look at that uh, this morning and see uh, what are we and what should we be? How, how does that work? Well, we're going to look at a, a number of ideas that we try to strive for. But as we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. And Lord, as we look at your word and we look at these ideas, I pray that you would work in each of our hearts so that we'd follow you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd guide my lips so that I'm saying what you want to be said and uh, that uh, we would uh, walk away from this uh, loving you more, loving each other more. I'm praying in Jesus' name, amen. The first one, as you see, I know it's already there. I can always see a lot of you are writing it down as I'm, as I'm getting started and so forth. Uh, the, the number one point I want to talk about is what is our purpose? What, what are we actually here for? We've got a flow chart that many of you have seen. I thought about printing it out today, but I decided not to. But we have a flow chart that begins, and the top of the chart, big square, is to glorify God. That's our number one purpose. Now, it actually spells it out a little more than that. It says to glorify God through the teaching of his word, or through the preaching of his word. Or, I think it actually says through the ministry of the word. In other words, God has given us instructions, and we're going to glorify him the way he's told us to. Okay? Now, there's room for difference of opinions. That's why one church could be a little different from another church as far as trying to do that. But yet, that's, that's what we're going to try to do. We want to glorify God uh, through the ministry of the scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We're striving to do everything to the glory of God. Now, Paul was writing that to a church. He wanted the church to do that, but it also trickles down to each of the members of the church. Our goal is to glorify God in the things that we do. I had you turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, actually, Peter's uh, talking here. I, I want to begin reading at verse 7. And he's talking about the fact that we know the end is coming sometime. Look what he says, verse 7. But, in the, end of all thing, or, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. 
as each one has received a gift that, that is a spiritual gift, as each has received a gift, minister it to one another. That is, serve one another with the skills that God has given you as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, or you could use the word serve, if anyone serves, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are here, our primary purpose, we believe, is to glorify God. And when I pray, uh, you'll notice that me and the deacons will quite often go into my office and we'll pray before the service. We pray for a couple different things, but one of the main things we always pray for is, Lord, may you be glorified by what we do today. We want God to be honored. We want God to be put on a pedestal. Okay? That's the idea of what we're trying to do. We're not about meeting personal wants. Now, I need to explain what I mean by that. Uh, for instance, the gospel is not about making you feel better. Some people preach the gospel that way. They preach the gospel in such a way as, do you, do you need to feel better? Uh, you know, do, do you need to uh, enjoy life a little more? Or whatever? And, and that's how they kind of present it. Well, the gospel is not about making you feel better. In fact, if anything, to get the gospel across, we've got to make you feel bad first. We've got to let you know that the scriptures say you're a sinner. Okay? We're, not, we're not so much trying to do the self-esteem thing. If anything, we want you to recognize what the Bible says about you. And then uh, that will hopefully make you recognize that God loved you anyway. And he, he's willing to do that. Now, again, it's not about making you feel better, but it does make you feel better. It's uh, worship, for instance, is not for your enjoyment. But you should enjoy it. I do, I do enjoy it. Worship is about giving something to God. Uh, worth-ship. God is worth it. And we're telling him that. And that's all that uh, worship is, is about. Uh, our teaching is not about puffing you up or making you feel good about yourself. But if you're willing to look at how, what God says about us and where he wants to take us, you will benefit from that for sure. But you know, because of that, there's some people that, that won't like being here. Okay, I, I get that not everyone's wanting to be here. Uh, they might find something else that, that they're looking for somewhere else. But we want to proclaim it as God has set forth. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to make it that way. We desire that in everything we do, that we glorify God by following the directions that he's given us. That's why when we get together, there's usually a sermon or a Bible study or something like that. We, we think that it's that important. Uh, we need to learn those things. And we need to continue growing and continue being what he wants us to be. Now that flow chart that I mentioned, we've got on the top is to glorify God through the ministry of his word. And then there's three main points under it. One of them is evangelism. Uh, one of them is uh, edification. One of them is expansion. Well, evangelism, of course, is us reaching out with the gospel to people, either corporately as a group or individually. Um, edification is about helping us each to grow as we walk with the Lord. It's not enough to just simply get saved and then wait for heaven to, to come. No, it's about us growing in our walk with the Lord. We're drawing closer to him, learning more about what he wants us to learn. Why do you think God gave the Bible anyway? He didn't give the Bible just so you'd have a history book to see what happened back then. He gave the Bible to teach you, this is what I want from you. This, this is where you're supposed to be heading. And, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. And then uh, it mentions expansion. And expansion has to do with not us growing number-wise, but it, it talks about us growing as an organization. Uh, when we find a new need, like, like remember several years ago we had our after-school program. Well, that's expansion. You develop a program to try to reach a certain need, and you develop the leadership to do it, and, and so you have that. Uh, we, uh, whatever we need to do, you know, every summer, uh, how do we get the, the place mowed around here? How do we get things taken care of? Well, we've got a couple of people to help take care of those things. That's all part of our organizational running, and the Lord wants us to do that. That's expansion. But we do all of those things so that we bring glory to God. That, that's our goal. That's what we're aiming for. That is our purpose, is to glorify him. We are his servants. It's not that he serves us. See, a lot of people want to treat Christianity like that, right? That what does it bring to me? What does it give to me? You remember the story in the Old Testament of Jacob? I like following his whole story. When Jacob first 
saw that Jacob's ladder, you know, he didn't talk about his dream, and he says, wow, God's promising me these things. Well, if God does this for me, then I'll follow him. It's a big if. I think that's the way a lot of modern Christianity is. But by the time he got through it all, and God brought him through, then he realized, you know what, I'm going to serve God no matter what. It's not if God does these things for me. I am going to follow him. And if you remember, he had named the place where he had his dream Bethel, which means the house of God. He thought the place was neat because he lays there and he sees visions of heaven. When he came back to it at the end of, of all of these trials God put him through, he changed the name from Bethel, the house of God, to El Bethel, the God of the house of God. You see? He wanted to follow God. He was interested in God, not so much what God could give to him. And he wanted to follow God and see God's plans fulfilled, take place. That's what we're striving for. That's why we're trying to bring glory to God. So that's our, that's our purpose, first of all. Well, let's look at the second point that we have here. What about our togetherness? Well, I've already talked about it a little bit, but our togetherness is, is we as a church should love each other. We should take care of each other. Now, there's a lot of different personalities when you get a group of people together. Not everyone's going to be your buddy. You know what I mean? But you can still love each other. You're not going to hang out with everyone. Not everyone's going to want to go out to pizza with you because of your personality or what have you. But they can still love you, and you can still love them. That's, that's what we're talking about. It's about being together, loving each other, um, and, and, and making sure that needs are met, that sort of a thing. And Jesus said this in John 13, 34 and 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so we really want to foster that. We think that's important. Remember, as I was sharing about what really made the difference in some of the churches where I was, yes, they preached and taught the scriptures, but it went beyond that. They loved each other. And we we're part of a family. And you, you, you know what? A family is a place where you can go and you can seek refuge sometimes just to get away from the world. Sometimes we need that with each other here. We can care for each other. We live in a rough world. We live in a world that, that is uh, full of, of judgmentalism, if you will. That, you know, you, we never match up to everyone's idea of what we should be. But we can come here to church and we can be a part of each other and love each other and be a shelter for each other. Um, I want to read, if you're still in 1 Peter, just turn back a couple books to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews is writing... Because there, there's a, this group of people is considering the idea that it, it, is God really doing all this? And, and they were teetering on the idea of, of do we keep following and doing this church thing as it's been where we're following Jesus like this. And look what he says in verse uh, 24 of chapter 10 and 25. He says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You see, we need to consider one. We need to try to stir up love and stir up good works in each other. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Lynn and I were just talking uh, with, with a family, friends of ours, and one of their adult child children is married, and this, this person and their spouse, they're not, they're not going to church anymore. They, they grew up in church. Both of them did. In fact, one of them was a pastor's child. And uh, they, they grew up in church. Well, now as they've gotten older, they just can't find a church that, that meets whatever criteria it is that they're looking for. So they haven't been going. They've been married for several years now. And they just haven't been going anywhere. Well, we could talk about a lot of things that dealing with that particular situation. But they're really missing out on this. Consider one another to stir up love and good works. They don't have anyone to stir them up. They don't have anyone to stir them up with love and good works toward following the Lord, toward walking with the Lord. I know you could make all the uh, uh, ideas in the world about saying, well, but we know Jesus, we're saved, and that's true. I mean, I'm not saying that they're not saved, but they are missing out on what Jesus has for them. Jesus said, I will build my church, and this is what he's trying to do. And he's not just talking about the universal church that includes everyone who's saved. He's talking about these individual churches and their place in the world. And, and they're missing out because they're not being a part of that. They need to be a part of that. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, we need each other. 
And that's the beauty of the, all this COVID stuff finally being gone, is we can be together more fully. And I know there were a number of us that had reasons why we couldn't be here, and that's good. I don't have a problem with that. But now that we're beyond that, it's so wonderful. We can finally be back together and have this uh, togetherness and so forth. There's all kinds of different personalities here, but we all find a home in a place like this. And that's, that's what it should be. Uh, the next point is, what about our help for one another? Yes, we show love for one another. Yes, we're accepting of each other. Uh, but what about our help for one another? Uh, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says this, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, we do need to bear one another's burdens. And, and a lot of people focus on the, the uh, earthly needs part of this, where we're bearing one another. And we truly need to care for each other. If there's uh, physical needs, we need to help, help with those physical needs where we can. If there's other things we can do, we, we need to try to be helpful uh, toward each other. We, we certainly do. You saw the early church do that in the book of Acts. Because they were under persecution, the church had to care for each other. And, and they, really were, they were literally sharing their, their uh, earthly possessions to help one another because they had to in their particular situation. But if you were to be in Galatians chapter 6, we just read verse 2. A lot of people skip verse 1. Verse 1 shows that the context of that verse is the context of if one of, your, one of the brothers in the church falls into sin, you need to help set that one right. So the whole idea of bear one another's burdens is really in the context of spiritual help, spiritual care for each other, and especially in the idea of sometimes you need to confront each other. Sometimes you need to let each other know, you know what, you're doing this, and there's, you're walking down a path that could lead to destruction for you. And, and we need to help each other in those things. And I know it's hard. And I know it, it, sometimes we have to d decide what's the best way. Is direct confrontation best? Or is giving an example over a longer period of time, is that best? We, we have to figure all that out. But the key is, is we still need to be doing that stuff. Uh, we need to love each other enough to help. And we need to love each other enough to intercede, to confront, how, whatever word you want to use for that. Uh, we need to be doing those things. But the key is, is we need to be living life together and walking that way. Uh, Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. So we certainly need to help each other in those things. And there is no such thing as minding your own business. Don't judge me. You know, it's funny. People who always say, You can't judge me. Only God should judge me. That should scare them to death. Yeah, because God's going to judge you all right. I'm only doing what God told me to do by being a help in this thing. So that you can get some things straightened around before that judgment time comes. You see? That's the idea. But we need to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And, and I certainly see, I think, that we do that. I think our church is a, is a good example of being able to do that sort of a thing. And then the last point I've got here is our desire. What, what is our desire? Well, we have a desire to follow the Lord. Uh, we're not simply to be a religious community. We're to be disciples. And so our desire is to be disciples. Well, what, what's entailed in being a disciple? If you would, please turn to John chapter 15. I'll get to there in just a minute. Here's a verse from John 14, though, 14 verse 15. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. You can talk about loving the Lord all you want. And there's people that will do that. They, they say they love the Lord. They'll play Christian music. They might even get real emotional in doing it. But Jesus said, if you love me, Obey my commandments. Are you, are you following the Lord? Are you living as he wants you to do? And then that brings us up to John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. Jesus said this, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You know, we've probably all heard that verse before we're talking about that your joy may be full. Well, what does it mean to have your joy to be full? Well, it's in the context of us following the Lord in obedience and living the way he wants us to live. Now, I, I get the idea that there's a, a number of different definitions on things and we can all we, we might all draw lines in different places but let's at least go to the things that he said and follow him 
and, and be the people that he wants us to be. He wants us to follow him. We talked about the Great Commission earlier where Jesus sent off his disciples, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. And he talked about evangelism, but then he said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Obedience is part of the Christian life. We're to walk with the Lord. And, and if we don't, we're not going to experience that full joy. If you want full joy, you're following the Lord and obeying the things that, that he has commanded us. And by the way, it doesn't just go to Jesus' words. You know, you might think of a Bible, the red letter edition, and you think those red letters are more important. Even the black letters are inspired by the Holy Spirit. The whole Bible is what Jesus wants for us to have. So we're not just following the red letters. We're following what every one of his chosen servants have given to us. That's the scriptures. And we're following them. We need to follow the Lord. And, and as you know, that's a lifelong process, isn't it? Yes, it begins at salvation. When you turn to Jesus for salvation, allow his death on the cross to, to pay the penalty for your sins. Uh, you're given spiritual life. You're given new life. But it extends beyond that. that. That's only the beginning. The rest of it starts. We call it, the Bible calls it sanctification, where we're growing and becoming more and more of what God wants us to be. That's a lifelong process. Not a single one of us are there yet. We've all got to keep moving in that direction. It's a, a lifelong process, and it certainly will go. I, I think back to when I first got saved. I was a 16-year-old kid. I was saved on the 4th of July, by the way. I'm an American Christian. 1980. So that means this year I'm 41 years old in the Lord now. Um, but when I first got saved, man, he changed my life. It just, I mean, it was an internal thing. For a while, I was just, it was almost like I was in a cloud because I was adjusting to all the changes. But God changed my way of thinking, changed my way of facing things. He didn't take away all my sin. I still struggle with sin. But what he did to me was he made me want to struggle with it rather than just live with it. And he made me want to get beyond those. And, and I was. I was able to get beyond a lot of things. There were things I struggled with then that I don't struggle with now at all. I mean, they don't, they don't tempt me at all. Uh, but there's, I keep finding more. <laughs> I keep finding more things that I've got to struggle with, more things that I need to weed out. Now it tends to be not so much actions. Now it tends to be more internal things like attitudes or, or uh, the way I view certain things, all of those things. But it's a continual growth process, and that needs to happen. So how do we stack up? How do we, the church, stack up? I think we stack up pretty good. I, I enjoy being a part of this church. I enjoy the family that we've got here. I enjoy uh, the care that we show for one another. But I'm not talking about from an organizational standpoint. I mean, some people want to make, make our church's organization, let the organization as a whole meet all these different needs. I don't think so. I mean, that's big government. I don't want big government. What I really enjoy about our church is I enjoy watching you watching many of you caring for the needs of someone else around you. Uh, we've got a number of single older ladies here. I love watching you guys care for each other. It, it's fun watching you uh, give each other rides, watching you uh, fellowship, go out and do certain things. Uh, uh, all of that, I mean, it's, just, it's fun to watch that. That's the church in action. And that's us doing those things. Well, how can each of us fit into this body? It's simple. You gotta be fat. You're gonna, I'm not talking about your weight. I'm talking about an acrostic. You gotta be fat. Yeah, I heard this one time and it makes so much sense. You gotta be faithful, you gotta be available, and you gotta be teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. You can be a part of this group. You can, you can be served by others, but you need to be able to serve others, and you need to constantly be growing. Constantly be learning. Constantly uh, filling up with the knowledge that God has provided. You know, God has given us so much treasures in this book, and none of us have mined enough of it yet. We've got a lot more to do, and we need to be doing that. We need to be faithful, available, and teachable. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. And, uh, it's been a good chunk of my life here, and, 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 and I certainly enjoy this. And, and uh, Father, I pray that you'd help each one of us to continue growing, continue walking with you. Uh, help us to continue uh, looking for instructions you've given us and putting it to work in our lives. Father, help us to uh, really take care of each other. 
Help us to uh, meet needs where we can meet needs. And if, Lord, if I can't meet someone's needs, help me to look for someone who can. But just help us to care for each other. And uh, today, Father, as we have this first potluck, now that we're beyond all of these restrictions that have been on us, uh, we are, we're looking forward to fellowshipping together, enjoying each other's company. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name.